Hi everybody, it's Sean. In today's video, I'm going to address two things. First, I'm going to address updates that are needed in my book, The California Legal Investigator. A lot of you are familiar with this book. You've seen this book on Amazon. And the second issue I'm going to address are any possible updates to the California Private Investigator exam. I would expect about 30 to 40 minutes of this presentation. I encourage you to watch the whole presentation. It's going to benefit you, especially if you're if you're going to be taking the California Private Investigator exam. So the first question is whether or not this book, California Legal Investigator, is still relevant for the current year. And my argument is yes. Guys, I get a lot of questions that come in from people who do not pass the exam, even with even those that purchase my book. And the questions that are asked are, are actually covered in the book. They're covered in the book and a lot of times, most of the time I'm able to reference a page number and a chapter and get back with the person who's asking me questions about whether the book is recent or not and any updates. When there's something major, I will do an update on it. I can't just fix a word, fix a sentence, and then get it republished. It doesn't work that way. You have to get somebody to line item, line edit each line that you are modifying. And if there's any pages that need to be modified, you got to get somebody to make sure that the pages are formatted correctly. This, this is a very lengthy procedure, and I don't want to remove the book from the shelf. Um, I believe that there's tons of utility still. Every month, I get between 40 and 100 people that purchase this book, the California Legal Investigator. Most are successful with the private investigator exam. The pass rate is still in the about 95%, those of you who purchase this book. And obviously, not everybody's going to pass, you guys. Um, those who have their experience restricted to surveillance operations tend to have a more difficult time on the exam. I'm not saying that they're smarter. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that they're less capable of others. It's just that a lot of the content is less familiar with them. But again, most most people who purchase this book are successful. And I highly recommend that you read all the reviews on Amazon. I don't hide anything. All my videos in the comment section, I, I keep open. As a matter of transparency, I will leave the comment section open on this video. You can make any comment, even negative, you like. And if, you, if you're wondering whether this is a good book or not, and if people are criticizing it, again, I will leave the comments open. I'm not going to block anybody. And that that is my that that is my objective to all of my readers. There are some book updates that are needed. I need to update the attorney client privilege. I do talk about it very briefly, but I need to go more in depth into it. And what I did is I created a video. So as of January, I had four people that fail. That, When you contrast that to the 40 to 100 people that purchase this book every year, it's a small percentage of people that fail. I do get some, and I will be honest that four people who have purchased my book have failed the private investigator exam. Currently, I got two of those persons who failed. I helped them out, and they passed. I mean, it's, it's really all on their own. It's up to them to pass but I provided them resource. And what I did is I provided them some answers, but I made a video just for them. And it's called the attorney client privilege. I will leave a link in the description. All they did is for the most part was watch that video and that video answered a lot of their questions. And that's my suggestion to you is read this book, California legal investigator. They, by the way, the questions, I practice exam questions. The questions are not the same as the real exam. You can't put the real questions in. Otherwise, that, that'd that actually be a, that'd be an offense. You guys, I would lose my, I could lose a private investigator license if I, if I do that. And I'm not going to jeopardize my career for something like that. Um, so that you won't get the same thing. But what you'll get is the knowledge base that you need to pass the exam. And a lot of people, tons of people are, are very confident. I will also talk about uh, very briefly some new subject matter that's coming in on the exam that 
could potentially confuse people. So let, let's move on. So this is where to find my book, The California Legal Investigator. It's on Amazon. Just type in The California Legal Investigator or my name, Sean Sundahl. Okay. And right now there's 77 ratings. Guys, a lot of people are, are making co positive comments on Amazon. If you feel like this book is positive, would you please leave a positive review? And I believe you could remain anonymous. It, it really does help me out. Um, so I, I would really, really appreciate that. I, I, it'd be nice if I can get more, more than 77 ratings. Every rating I get, I, I value you guys' input and I value the positive news. Um, and what I really like is a lot of people are reaching out to me privately. Well, not a lot of people. The four have reached out to me privately instead of bashing me um, on a rating and, and say, hey, your book doesn't help. Can you help me? And then that's where I came up with that hour and 40 minute video on attorney client privilege helped out those those four people. And if you're one of those four people and you believe that you've been cheated or I have not helped you and I haven't been honest, then you can please feel free to comment in the section below in the comment section. I'm fully transparent with you all. It's currently retails for $99. Okay, you guys, this, finding all the information here, it's gonna take you more than an hour, more than two hours, probably more than a week. So I condense everything into a book that has a total of 500, give me a second, about 517 pages, including the index. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty thick book, as you can see, but it's well worth it. Okay, let's talk about updates. So this is th this section, this topic, this slide, these are things that I need to update in my book. These are things that other people have brought to my attention. On page 162, I have a stolen vehicle section. It talks about public records. Um, so on page 162, I made an error. Okay, I'm gonna admit here in public, I made an error. I referred to the National Insurance Crime Bureau as NICB, uh, but I was really referring to the National Crime Information Bureau, the NCIB. Okay, that, that's an error. I've had three people bring that to my attention. Whenever somebody brings these small errors to my attention, I already know that they're gonna pass the private investigator exam. And everybody who's found these small errors in my book, they pass because they pay attention to detail. There's one question out there. It's either on the practice exam or the final exam they have. Um, I don't know what question is, what answer it is, but there is a typo in it. Um, once I find that typo, I will bring it. I will bring it to the attention of you on this channel. And another gentleman brought to my attention that on page 231 and 232, I talked about a 30-day period and a debtor. Um, I, I meant to say creditor on, on both the pages, not debtor. So I apologize if that brought any inconvenience. So please refer to those pages if you do have the book. And by the way, you don't need the book to pass. It just helps you pass. So on the pretest question number four, it's a workers' comp question. Um, C is the correct answer, not A. About three other private investigator applicants have brought this to my attention, and they have all passed. Okay, you can, you find these small little typos. Okay, you're gonna pass. Not guaranteed, but I highly believe you're you're gonna pass the private investigator exam, and that's what I see with a lot of people that, that show me these small little typos. Okay. Um, also the license fees, they're not, they're not $200 anymore. Now it's $725 to have a private investigator agency and a qualified manager, um, attached to that license just to have, just to run a private investigator company. It's $725 application fee. The $4 that you see right there, that is for the photo ID. So in reality, it's seven hundred twenty-nine dollars, not two twenty-five or two fifty, however much I, I wrote in my book. So that changed. The attorney-client privilege, the work product doctrine. You guys, in my book, California Legal Investigator, I talked, I did talk about it, but I felt the need to go a lot more into detail. And this is the video that I produced. I will leave a link in the description below. It's called the attorney-client legal privileges. It's covered in chapter twenty-six. It's an hour and 40 minute long video. This video will help you answer a lot of the questions. Um, the private investigator exam has anywhere from 20 to 30 questions. 
the, the, the real estate exam that, that referenced the attorney client privilege or the work product doctrine. And I, I talk about every possible scenario that you might come across, even, even in the real world. Watch the video, please. Please watch it, and I think it's gonna help you. Guys, if you watch this video and watch the end of this video that I'm making right now and read this book, okay, and you actually and you follow the directions that are stated in this book, I think there's a very good chance you're gonna pass the private investigator exam. Okay, so this is where people are having problems. They're when they're failing and just because I'm mentioning the word failing, you guys, this, a, this rarely happens. I am always fully transparent with all of you. People rarely fail the private investigator exam that have purchased my book and that watch my videos and follow the directions. They rarely fail. But when they do, it's because of ethics, planning, and trial preparation. Let's talk about this. So this is the study guide and I'm gonna put in quotation marks, study guide that BSIS offers to you. And they tell you that 18% of the exam is based off ethics. On the left column, it says job task. Each question has to correspond with a specific, a real job task that you will endure as a, as a licensed private investigator. The exam needs to make sense in the real world. And on the right is associated knowledge um, column. So if you read K, K1 through K10, this tells you what you need to study. I highly recommend you read this, but most wonder where do you get this information from and can you be more specific? In the California Legal Investigator, I cover the majority of these ethical topics. Now, some people have asked um, what section is it in and sometimes I have to, I have to help them, but you guys, the chapters in the California Legal Investigator, they're not split among ethics, trial preparation, and, and planning. It, it is scattered through the book. I have created the book in, in such a way that you could find it based on topic, but the ethics, planning, and trial preparation, is, it is scattered throughout the book. Um, I probably will not change that unless I get more people that ask, but the way that it's created, it, it has been evaluated by two licensed attorneys and a and, and two editors. Um, and the way that it's set up right now with the chapters, it works for most people. So I probably won't change that. But again, you have to you have to read the whole book, you guys. Okay, you read the whole book. Many times when I get an email from somebody who's failed the exam and they want me to clarify some specific topics or discuss further topics. I tell them, hey, look, it's in the book. And I give them specific page numbers and chapters. Uh, it does take me a lot of time to respond to these emails, maybe about an hour or so, but it, it, it's in the book, okay? And by the way, if, 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 if you get a link to this video, it's because I can't, I can't address the, the issue as effectively in writing than as if I make a video, if that makes any sense. So please don't feel offended if you ask me a question and then I send you a video, meaning this video. Okay, so planning, that's 18% of, of your exam. Look look at, see what the where the percentages are, are and concentrate more on that when you study for your exam. So planning is 18%. We have the column on the left that says job task. This is task that, that the writers of the prime investigator exam this, th these are tasks that they feel that you're gonna have to perform a licensed private investigator and the questions that are asked have to reflect the task and then on the right is associated knowledge the right column k11 through k through 17 you have to look up all this information and i i it's most of it's in the book most of it's in in the book that i have for you california legal investigator okay let's look at something else I apologize if the camera is going up and down. I have this on an unsteady table. Just look at, doesn't mean there's an earthquake. It's just on an unsteady table. Trial preparation, 11%. Okay, there's 11% of your exam. Job task, left column, right column, associated knowledge. 
you guys, I, I cover the majority of trial preparation in here. I can't cover every single topic, but most of the topics are in the book. Okay. Remember, I will leave a link to the stud, the BSIS study guide. It's not helpful. It's not helpful to, for most of you, but if you want to know what the state provides as a study guide, then, then this is it. Let's move on. Okay, give me a minute to review my notes here. Okay, so these are recent issues. A lot of people that fail, and I'm, I'm again, I'm talking about a handful of people. I remember the conversations I had with people that fail. That's how few fail that who purchase my material. They are unable to apply the law and industry standards to different fact patterns. So w one gentleman. So in the book, I talk about climbing a fence, a chain link fence to serve papers, to serve process that you can you can do that. But then when the prime investigator exam mentions that there's a solid brick wall, uh, people tend to get confused. You guys, it's, you have to know what the principles are. You have to know what the laws are, what the industry standards are. They might even say that there's a that there's a, um, a moat that's filled with alligators. Okay, as long as you have a good foundation on what the law says and what the standards say, they can throw you any situation. And I can't address every single situation because they they change the exam every two to three years. They change the fact. I'll tell you this: they change the facts. The laws rarely change, but the facts will change every two to three years. Laws involving private investigators they rarely change, and when they do, I'll make a video of it on YouTube. And I rarely have to do that. So some people um, who fail, they they want to know, hey, what what's the what kind of crime classification if you lie in court? What is it? Well, look, every time that you're testifying in court, you are creating evidence. It's you're testifying on, on on evidence. So it doesn't matter if you're introducing a physical item into a tangible item into evidence, or if you're stating what the what the what your observations are it's still evidence and if you lie in court it is a felony now if you'd make a false report that'd be a misdemeanor most cases but if you're lying in court it's a felony and i said this once and i'll say it again a long time ago we're talking about i mean when the nation was still being created our beautiful america if you lied in court you get the death penalty that's how severe the crime of perjury is Okay, you can you cannot fabricate evidence. And remember, even in my book, you guys, I, I state that evidence doesn't merely mean a tangible item. It means an observation when you're testifying in court ab about it. Okay, so we we need I need you guys to understand that the laws rarely change. The facts of the question will change often every two to three years. Okay, subpoena power. Who has power to subpoena? Well, it's usually the court officers. And a court officer is generally referred to as the the attorneys. Okay, the attorneys are court officers and the judges are court officers as well. Anyone anyone that's that's a licensed attorney has that subpoena power, okay? An attorney can hire or employ an attorney's agent that can um, write up a subpoena. That's that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, if you're a party to a case and you're arguing your case, present your case pro per, that means by yourself without an attorney, you have subpoena power. Okay. The grand jury has subpoena power. Who did I not mention here? Guys, a law enforcement officer does not have subpoena power. If they want some power or subpoena, I think technically a judge has to sign off on a, on a subpoena. But remember, this is, goes back to your history class. There's powers of separation. You have a judicial branch, you have executive branch. Law enforcement is executive branch. Why would the legal system give you judicial authority and that authority means subpoena power? That would, in, that would mean that you would have judicial authority and, and you would have executive 
authority. That that goes against our standards of the American justice system, you guys. That's not, that's not the way it, way it works. So, so people who have subpoena power, licensed attorneys, um, attorney's agent, anyone that's a part of the case and, and grand jury. Somebody asked me about subpoena limits. You guys, I did not mention subpoena limits in my book. So what what that should infer is that there's no limits on the number of subpoenas that you can that you can serve. Okay, that that's what I mean. You have to understand what the rule of law is. You have to understand what the industry standards are. You have to you have to read the book. There's no subpoena limits. Now, what we do know about subpoenas is you can't use it to harass people. You can't use the power of subpoena to harass people. You can't set unreasonable grounds. So you can't you can't have somebody generally um, come from Florida and testify in California without some type of compensation and some type of, of need. Um, it's very difficult to – those are the limits on subpoena power, but we don't limit the, the number of subpoena attempts. Um, now, through the case law, there are – there's case law limits generally about three to four times to serve somebody a summons. And summons is is a, is an order to appear in court at a set place and time. Um, we do know that after about three to four times, um, if you can't reach this person, you could subserve them, which means you can – if somebody else is at the house and they know of this person and they're in contact with this person, you can serve this other person. And that's what we know about about limits when it refers to summons. And a subpoena and summon two different things, and I am clear about that in my book. They're going to ask you – they could possibly – when I say they are or they're going to, I'm just saying that they possibly can ask you these questions on the state exam. I don't know for sure they do or not. I don't have legal access to the state exam, and nobody else does. Nobody does. So they're going to ask you more questions. If an attorney does this, maybe lies, steals, or something like that, or wants you to to commit a crime, what do you do? The moral questions. Now, when in doubt, you all, I would always I would always speak to an attorney first. Speak to an attorney, somebody that has legal knowledge. Ask them. Don't ask the same attorney. Ask another attorney. Hey, they're asking me to do this. What should I do? Um, what I notice on the state exam is they want us. I have the the feeling that whoever's writing the most recent exams, they want to impose a moral obligation on us, their own standards, um, not industry standards, but their own. And I think that's wrong. But if you have any moral questions that appear on your exam, you, you want to – if it involves an attorney – okay, be careful on this. If it involves an attorney, you want to report the incident to the bar. Okay, the, the state bar, and I think real life, I, I think that's something that you should definitely consider, but there's no legal obligation. It's just a moral obligation. Those are my moral obligations. Remember, if it's a moral obligation, you don't have to follow it, but if it's if it's a legal obligation, that's different. But sometimes moral obligations can turn to legal obligations. Okay, I, I don't want to confuse you. If there's a moral issue on the exam, contact an attorney. If you have those options available, if the attorney – if those options are available and the attorney is involved in something that's sketchy or they want you to get involved in something sketchy, contact the bar. I would not continue working the case. I would immediately contact um, the, the, the state bar okay? because you don't want to be an accessory or, or a conspirator to any type of crime. And they're going to – you guys, they're going to keep distracting you. The, the, the distractor questions just keep getting worse over the years. It doesn't matter if – this is something horrible for a child to be molested. It's horrible, but you're going to see – you could see molestation, rape, um, just crimes that just make us cringe on the exam, and they're trying to steer you away from the right answer. Um, if you're representing somebody like this who has maybe admitted to something that's just horrible, you are under no – Generally, okay, most of the time you're under no legal obligation to notify law enforcement. What you want to do is finish. You want to remain objective, okay? Just focus on the job that you are hired to do, okay? If it's get a statement, you get a statement. If some other moral indecencies come up, okay, it's up to you if you want to turn them in on that. But focus on the reason why you're hired. You guys, when you see the word rape, molestation, murder, 
they're distracting you from the right answer. Okay, so for surveillance operations, you don't want to compromise yourself. When you're doing the pre-surveillance operations, if you go out and you start interviewing people, you start arriving at the job site and talking to people and taking photographs, you're going to compromise yourself. You don't want to do that. You want to stay focused. And if you have to do a surveillance, well, you're going to end up doing a surveillance. But I think, in my opinion, that you're burning yourself, that if you're going to the job sites and you're interviewing coworkers, um, these coworkers can, can be connected with the subject of the investigation. Um, so I generally prefer, I like to do the surveillance on the person's address, okay? Somebody had asked me about weapon storage. As a private investigator, how how do you handle a firearm? Okay, so the first thing is this. If you wanna carry a concealed firearm, you gotta have a CCW, carry concealed weapon permit in the state of California. Now, as for Having an exposed firearm permit, that's actually a gray area that I discussed in the California Legal Investigator. But this is the trick. If you need to use it, eventually that gun is going to be exposed and you can bet your butt that BSIS is going to discipline you because you didn't have exposed permit. That gun will become exposed if you need it. Okay, and, and that, that's going to be their argument. So it is kind of like in the gray area. Now, if you don't have a concealed weapon permit and you just have an exposed firearm permit, then you have to carry it exposed. But remember, as a private investigator, there's no – you're normally not wearing private security patches, right? You're wearing your regular clothes, your, your tie, your shirt, maybe a sweater, and for you to have a gun on the outside – exposed is unusual in California. If you're in Tennessee or Arizona, this is common. Um, our state is a non-Second Amendment friendly state, and I'll be blunt about those words. Anything associated with a gun is bad, especially if you're a private investigator. Nobody knows who you are. Now, you do have to wear your, your ID and make it fit visible, but most people don't know who you are so i think in most cases it's a bad idea to have an exposed firearm now another thing that you could do is you can have a gun in your car just in case you need it now remember you always need to have insurance if you're gonna if you're gonna be armed um, private investigator now i'm not an attorney i'm not giving you legal advice but this is my interpretation of the law as far as i know it not as a police officer not as a peace officer but as a, a citizen you could have it in your trunk, okay, as long as it's unloaded, meaning that there is no magazine in the well of the gun, and the gun is, it's in the trunk, uh, and the trunk is closed, you're not able to access it. Now, if you have a truck where you don't have a trunk, you could put it in a locked box unloaded, okay, it needs to be in a, in a locked box. You can't put it in your glove compartment, and you can't put it in the, in the middle console. It needs to be in the actual lock container. Now, some consoles inside have lock containers and that's something different, but you gotta pick the two. So know your weapon storage. Union busting. This is the newest topic that's been asking me of recent private investigator exam takers. Uh, it, it looks like that now people might be hiring private investigators to help union bust, and the word union bust already has negative connotations. Section Section 8, subsection A1 of the National Labor Relations Act 
uh, covers the right of workers and private employ employment and private or those who are in who belong to private employers um, you're able to form a union and to bargain collectively if there's somebody that's preventing you from doing that well that person is known as a union buster and it's quite common for an employer to hire a private investigator to help union bust that private investigator may also be asked to threaten employment okay to threaten threaten termination if this person doesn't cooperate guys this is a, this is a violation of section 8a1 of the national labor relations act okay and this act is relevant if your private employer engage in interstate commerce you guys this is it's so easy to engage in interstate commerce if you use the internet and maybe the provider is located in another state maybe you make telephone calls to other states or use a World Wide web the www and you need to access information from other for people located in other states other countries you are easily engaged in interstate commerce and if you're private you're with a private employer section 8a1 of the national labor relations act pertains to you again every information that i discuss in this video is not legal advice not technical advice not professional advice this is just my personal opinion the information could be wrong and i always need you guys to fact check that's my disclaimer now it's it says here it's an unfair labor practice for an employer to interfere with restrain or coerce employees in the exercise of the rights guaranteed okay you have a right to form a union and to bargain collectively if the employer uses you as a prime investigator as a tool to break the union you're going to be responsible ladies and gentlemen okay don't do it those of you who are in public employment or you're going to work for a public employer as about half of you probably are maybe fire or police post background investigations um the myers milius brown act the mmba act gives local public employees the right to unionize do not bring become the union breaker okay okay employees versus subcontractors as a qualified manager for a private investigator business you are responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the business you're responsible for your employees okay now as the owner of the private investigator license it is my opinion that that your employees can use the license number your license number and your name of the business in the performance of their job duties but they can never ever identify themselves as a licensed private investigator they are not licensed private investigators they are an employee of a licensed private investigator i often come across surveillance agents who are from other counties in my law enforcement career i approach them and they give me a business card of a, a private investigator and they don't even know what the license number is um they don't know the full name of the company and they're they're very close to violating the the private investigator act and you gotta be really careful now you can hire a subcontractor but if you hire a subcontractor to perform uh, job duties that you that you would be contracted to ordinarily perform or maybe not um, they use their own license number okay not yours remember your employees have to be under your supervision and your control if they want to use your license number and it doesn't mean that that your employee could put on a business card private investigator your license number the name of your company no okay they have to identify themselves as a representative or an employee not as a private investigator i see this all the time people people do not understand the law hiring experts whenever there's a technical question on the exam or any any anywhere on the prime investigator realm hire a professional expert you guys bsis assumes that you are not an expert in any field and whenever you see any question pop up that might require you to hire an expert you got to hire an expert many of you are former highway patrol some of you are made team officers or investigators or you're even traffic reconstructionists the bsis doesn't care so when you see a question that involves using a formula or calculation or a specific technical skill 
no, I'm not going to take on this assignment. I'm going to have to subcontract or refer out this type of service. Okay, so again, BSIS assumes that you are not an expert in any type of field. I've had some questions about calculating net worth. Okay, so this is your net worth. It's your assets, it's your liabilities deducted from your assets. That's, this is your net worth. So you have to find out what somebody's assets, what they are. You could do that by going to the county recorder's office. You might find real estate, okay? And they might tell you who owns a property, who owns the, who's the, the mortgagee on the, on the house or the property. Sometimes I think boats are also listed at the county recorder's office. Now, to determine liabilities, there's a couple things that you could do. A credit report will show what they owe and who they owe the money to. So if you have a, a if, if you have a $800,000 house, okay, it's worth 800,000 and you owe $750,000 on it, while well, your assets are technically only $50,000. Okay? And your net worth right now with just those numbers is $50,000. Income, how do we determine, because income, income could be a part of the assets. I mean, every year, if, assuming somebody doesn't doesn't spend that on liabilities, how do we determine someone's income? Well, we can't determine a, an exact range, I'm sorry, an exact number, but we could determine a range, and that range is based off of tax brackets. So if somebody pays a certain amount of, of taxes every year, and we can get copies of tra tax transcripts with the permission of the taxpayer or a court order, Otherwise, we can't, but if we get that and we find out how much they paid in taxes in any given year, we could find out more or less what tax bracket, and that'll give us a range of, of what their income is. If you can get that and you can get a copy of the credit report, well, you get the assets, you minus liabilities, and you, you can get somebody's net worth that way. Um, the, the fact patterns have been changing recently, but you have to know what each document will produce okay now there's not much difference between the federal taxes and the state taxes the main difference and again i'm not an accountant this is just my personal non-professional opinion the only difference in those forms really well the difference between federal and state really is that state taxes you significantly less um, but you're still disclosing how much how much income that you're getting you're also disclosing how much taxes you pay to the federal government but the information on both of those forms, federal and state, they're very similar. So if I can get a state tax form and a, and a credit report, I think that'll draw us closer to calculating one's net worth. Okay, and we wanna know what one's net worth is because we, we wanna know whether or not it's in our interest, well, for the attorney's interest to sue this person. Because if, if their net worth is zero or negative, well, you're not going to get a lot of money. And many times attorneys will hire you to do an asset locate. They want you to find out how much this person is, how much net worth is. So this is something that you might see again. There's been um, some questions on pre-screening. So you might have a client with behavioral health issues. You guys, if they have a behavioral health issue, you still need to talk to them and find out what type of service they need. Just because they have a behavioral issue doesn't mean that you just discount them. You don't take on any assignment. Uh, because depending on some other f circumstances, this can be an ADA, American Disabilities Act violation, if you discriminate based on somebody's uh, behavioral health state. Because having a behavioral health issue is considered an ADA um, issue you might need to accommodate this person but first we need to find out if this person what this person needs guys i get a lot of people who do not appear to be uh, mentally stable reaching out to me trying to find people um trying to locate a, a ghost uh, um just just something that it, it's very difficult for me to perform as, as as a private investigator um very very difficult let me read my notes here and I, I end up not taking a lot of the, the these cases, actually nearly all the cases. But first find out what, meet with them for sure and find out what service they need. You don't need to 
get a hold of a behavioral health specialist to find out what their issue is. No, find out what they need. Okay, just because they're having behavioral health problems doesn't mean that they can't make an intelligent decision. And when they do sign the contract, remember they have to be they have to know what they're signing. Okay, so sometimes maybe it might involve an attorney um, to be with this person, or maybe maybe an administrator. Okay, maybe this uh, maybe this person is under a conservatorship. You definitely want to have an administrator present if they're agreeing to any um, any any contract. Pretexting, you guys in California, legal investigator, I tell you numerous times, do not pretext. I get a lot of people from the insurance industry telling me that hey, they operate in the gray area, and their employer allows them or recommends that they pretext. You guys, that's the insurance. If you are working directly for the insurance company directly as an employee, you can pretext. And the case law is clear on that. And the case law is clearly described in the California Legal Investigator book. But most, but those of you who are taking the exam, you're, you're taking the exam not to work directly for the insurance company, but to become a licensed private investigator. Do not choose any answers that involve pretexting. Don't do it. Don't don't work in the gray area. Okay. I'm going to make that clear. So people every year ask me about pretexting. You don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. So questions on the exam. How many questions are there? Okay. In my book, California Legal Investigator, I state that there's 100 questions on the state exam. They have changed over the years. Some get 120, some get 125, but some are between 100 and 120. I'm going to make clear that that's something that I need to change in, in my book. But it doesn't matter if they give you 300 questions, 500 questions, as long as you know the rule of law, the standards of our industry, case law, then you should be fine with every single question that they pose. They can give you a thousand questions. They can give you five questions. You have to know the rule of law. So this is some intelligence that I received from one of you guys, actually. And this, this involved written correspondence. I never disclosed my sources or any or any information that would direct you or connect you from one person to another this is direct if i have something quotation marks on the screen it's because bsis has said this in in, in written correspondence a representative the pass rate is 70 percent in my book i believe i had it at 72 percent or 73 percent but it's 78 percent that's something I need to correct in my book. No publishers or training sponsors have legal access to BSI's exam materials, questions, and questions are changed frequently. You guys, I don't have the answers to the book. I'm sorry, the answers to the exam in this book. This is a very good book that will help you pass, but I don't have, I do not have legal access. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest about that, okay? The questions are changed frequently. My opinion, every two to three years, um, you can get different versions of the exam. See, there are several different versions of the licensing the exam administered. Doesn't matter. They give you 50 different versions. Every time you take the exam, you retake it, you might get a different version. But remember, you, you have to stand steady on the, on the foundational knowledge of the profession. And, and this is the crazy thing that I just that I'm reading here. The scoring scale is based on the difficulty of the exam. So some people might actually get a more difficult exam than the others. I don't know how fair, I don't know why this is fair, but this is coming directly from the horse's mouth. And it says here, a passing score on one exam may not be the same for another version of the exam. This is what BSIS says. And I have to reread it three or four times because I couldn't believe what I was reading. But no, this is, this is what they're saying. You can get a totally different score than somebody else and, and pass. Um, but I think what's consistent is the pass rate, which is 78%. So your raw score can be totally different from someone else's. Um, so somebody could get a raw score. Uh, actually, I'm not going to give you a hypothetical. I'm just going to confuse them more. But you can get a different score than somebody else. Somebody else can pass with the same score 
It just depends on the exam that you got for that day. And it says here that the PI exam has a criterion reference passing score, thus the score isn't determined by dividing the number of answers on the exam. Previously, I thought that the exam is based um, on you dividing the, the, the numbers of answers on the exam. It's not. It's a criterion reference based exam. And I am a little bit, I was a little bit confused. Criterion establishes um, certain percentages for certain knowledge bases of the private investigator field. Um, you have to score in the in the appropriate percentage uh, base to, to pass. And this just seems, I think the more I talk about it, the more I'm gonna, I'm gonna confuse you. Um, definitely, I would research criterion reference passing score, but if you're gonna research the score, you're gonna spend an hour or half an hour researching it. I think your time is probably better spent um, researching the issues that you need to have improvement on. And that's just my most humble advice that I can give to you right now. Um, they talked about, see previously I thought it was a norm reference exam where you just divide the correct answers. Um, the, the norm reference exam in particular is the number of questions answered correctly divided by the number of questions on the exam. Most people think that that's the case. That's how I thought the case was, but it's not. Okay, and initially I thought that it's a hundred question exam and 20 questions, because sometimes what they do on the state exams is they they put these uh, these questions that don't that don't mean anything to the score. They just add to the total number, and if a certain number of people keep getting the, these questions correct, um, it will be an official it will be an official answer. I've seen these on a lot of state exams. Um, I, th I still think that that might be the case, maybe for about five questions, four, and I'm here, I'm just guessing, but I have no proof of that. Okay, as let's conclude. Is the California Legal Investigator a good book to study? I'm going to be biased about it. Yes, don't take my word for it. Read the reviews on Amazon. If it helps you, please leave me a positive um, Amazon review. If you don't want everyone to know that you bought the book. At least leave me five stars if you believe that I deserve it. I think, still think it's going to help you guys. I'm still convinced that if you read my book, The California Legal Investigator, you watch the attorney-client privilege video, hour and 40 minutes long, and you watch this video, I think that there's a very good chance that you're going to pass the exam. If you guys have any other questions, please let me know. Good luck for the private investigator exam, and I wish you all the best, and I hope to keep in touch with all of you. You guys all take care.